Hey guys, how's it going? Welcome to this week's weekly recap video. Before we get into the questions from last week's videos, I just wanted to say I hope all of you guys in the Northeast and Midwest and all the areas that are experiencing or just experienced that extreme drop in temperatures, I hope you guys are doing okay. I hope that your plants survived. I mean, I have a ton of harvest guard. That's what I usually throw on top of my plants if there's gonna be you know, a sudden fluctuation of temperature. But I feel like even covering stuff, there would probably be, I'm, I'm guessing some damage just because your plants are not, when it's so warm and then it drops so suddenly, they're just not ready for it. And I just, I just hope you guys, your gardens made it out okay. I would love to know how you guys are all doing. Um, like, you know, we've been there, maybe, maybe not in such a bad situation, but like last fall, um, our nights were in the forties and then one night it plummeted to nine degrees and it just, I mean, you've seen our boxwoods and how bad they look. I mean, it killed them like several inches into the boxwood, which is a huge bummer. And I know they'll live, they'll just look bad for a little while. Um, so I can kind of like relate a little bit, but I know M.I. Gardner, Luke at M.I. Gardner lost his whole fruit crop this year and his bees. And I just, I can't even imagine that kind of discouragement. So my heart goes out to you guys. I hope you're doing okay. Okay, so now let's get into last week's videos. The first one, if I can get my computer to turn on. What is my battery power at? We're good. Okay, was the tour of my parents' garden 2020. So I don't think we've ever, have we toured their garden any earlier than this? So I think this is the earliest tour we've done. It was just looking so pretty and I thought you guys might like to see it when some of the tulips were in bloom. We planted some of those tulips and some of the perennials that we showed in that tour. And it's just fun to share. That's my childhood home. I mean, we moved there when I was six and it was nothing compared to what it is today. And uh, you know, it was just such a huge family project throughout the years. and. I don't know. It's just a really fun thing to share with you guys. So Janet said, where did your parents get the Four Seasons statues? I have the same ones, but someone stole spring and summer, which is so, I can't even believe somebody would do that. Like if you're going to steal the Four Seasons, why not steal all four? <laughs> Why spring and summer? It doesn't make any sense. But those come from Unique Stone and they are the Genoa seasons because I think they've got a couple other different sets of seasons that are bigger. So anyway, dang. I hope you can get those replaced. Uh, Nate said, Laura, are you planning on doing raspberry beds like your parents have on the new land? Yes, we are. I think I'm going to be doing two 50 foot rows. I want to have at least 50 feet of fall golds and then 50 feet of an ever bearing red, probably heritage or Caroline. I'm not sure which one yet, but those won't go in until next spring at least. It might be the year after. It just depends on how everything goes this year. There's just a lot of projects going on right now. Uh, Sheila says, at one time I seem to recall that your parents also had fruit trees. I haven't seen them in a while. Where are they in relation to the house gardens and pool? So they had them all removed this year. So they're putting in something new down there. Uh, they're kind of, they're, it's not set in stone what they're going to be doing. I think it will be much better than what they had there. They only had like the fruit trees that were there. So most of them were really old. Um, and I think unless pr fruit trees are treated properly the entire span of their life, um, I think that they've got a certain, well, all plants have a certain lifespan and a lot of them were just starting to peter out or they had a lot of damage. And um, so they just decided to, you know, bl clear it out, blank, blank slate it, clear it out and do something new that they would enjoy better. Um, so hopefully we'll be able to bring you along for a part of that process. And that is right down below. Like if you go to the bottom of the pool, like down below the rock walls, if you kind of keep going down that hill, it's down below the lower yard. There's like a big rock wall that leads down to that area, if that makes sense. And just Mr. Rebel said, what grass do they have? Uh, it is a blend of perennial rye and Kentucky bluegrass. And that is primarily what we have here in our garden as well. It does really well in our area. Uh, June says, at minute 2010, what is the exotic looking plant that seems to have been cut back and is flushing with new foliage about three to four feet tall? I love it. I think what you're referring to is a Sutherland gold elderberry. It's kind of to the back of me on the right. And it does have really beautiful kind of yellowy chartreuse foliage. Uh, Patricia said, I love your channel so much. Thank you. Do you ever take cuttings from your parents' garden to root at home? It seems like the perfect garden to get beautiful plants from. They have so many beautiful plants. I have from time to time, especially in our old garden. Um, I got some of those ranunculus. They're like the little wild yellow buttercups. They're super cute. And they're something that I want to have here as well. So at some point I'll probably go and dig some of those. Um, and then I planted a couple of viburnums that had seeded themselves out at my parents' house and um, they were just gonna clear them out of the flower bed. So I dug them up and took them and they're huge now. Like I haven't gone into our old backyard, but I can see them like towering over the fence. I haven't done a lot of digging and bringing to this new space yet. 
but I'm sure we will. Amy said, what a gorgeous garden. What is planted, planted under their lilac tree? The one with the large dark green foliage. It's a rhubarb plant. That's a Victoria rhubarb. And it's fairly shaded there. And that plant still does really well. It's been there as long as I can remember. Lynn says, I love your parents' gardens. I've enjoyed every tour you've done there. Where do you buy your brownie and La Belle Epoque tulips? So the brownies came from my parents' garden center. I think the brand was like Van Eng Engelman, something like that. And La Belle Epox came from Eden Brothers. You Grow Gail said, hold on a second. When you were clearing, did you say that that was earlier this spring? It doesn't even look like the same space. Yes, so we did a video of clearing out a bunch of the flower beds there at my parents' house earlier this spring, and it doesn't look like the same place. Both of our gardens kind of take on a different, totally different look in the winter time when all the perennials die back and you just really see the bare kind of bone structure of the garden that's why winter interest is so important and i'm trying to up my game in several areas of my, our garden and they've got beautiful winter structure there but it really does morph into something spectacular and it does it really quickly next question was what do they use for weed control is there landscape fabric under the beds no no landscape fabric that i know of in that garden at all. We use it under our boxwood hedges and arborvita hedges to keep bindweed out, but they just hand pull and we hand pull primarily too, um, except for our gravel driveway. So yep, just a lot of hand pulling and staying on it. Uh, William said, do they put any Christmas lights in their garden like yours? Do you have any drone footage or anything of that? We really need to, my dad, loves to do Christmas lights. It's a huge deal and that's why I was so excited when um, I married Aaron and learned that he was so festive about Christmas time because um, Aaron loves to do the Christmas lights as you guys know and my dad does a huge show as well. Maybe we could do like a joint light tour this next year and kind of take the drone out because he does like their whole fence line and they've got like just under five acres so they I mean it's really beautiful. Oh, that was the next question. How many acres do your parents have? Just under five. Uh, about two of it is in landscape gardens and the rest is in pasture. Uh, Melanie said, thank you for the tour of your parents' amazing garden. I always enjoy seeing it because it shows where your love of gardening comes from. Do your brothers and sister have the same love of gardening? Are their homes, home gardens just as beautiful? So my brother and sister aren't into it quite as much as I am. My sister, for sure not. She does some containers. Um, they aren't, she and her husband aren't in a permanent home yet. Um, they are, they live in Washington and they're hoping to move back to the area. Um, so she does containers. She is into cooking, like that is her jam. She loves it. Um, and then my brother, he actually works part-time down at the garden center. He is a professor at the local college here as well. Um, and he enjoys having a really nice garden space and they're really developing it a lot. Um, like they're putting in a picket fence around their garden space and expanding it like their vegetable garden area. And they've been working on their flower beds. And we did a patio project there at my brother and sister-in-law's house. It was the year Benjamin was born. So like two, what year was that? 2018, <laughs> two years ago, we did a patio project, which they're building a pergola around and they've cut out flower beds around. So it's really starting to take shape. Adele said, the garden is beautiful. I have a question. What are the arrow shaped leaves below the golden smoke bush? And I can never remember the name of this plant. I'm gonna have to call my mom. I can't even remember what I do in a home garden space. I brought some of it here and then it completely died back. And I thought, I mean, it was early in the season too and it didn't show up for the whole entire rest of the year. So like summer and fall. And then the next year it started emerging from the, the ground. I don't know what it was, but it's a resilient plant. Okay, hold on, let me ask my mom. Okay, so I text her, she's not answering her phone right now. Um, so I will come back to that question if she responds to me while we're still filming. Last question from this video was Camille said, you seem like you're not a big fan of conifers. You live in a great climate for some amazing evergreens. Why do you like your annuals so much more than your conifers? Well, we do have a lot of conifers in this garden. Like if you count how many arborvitas alone we've planted over well over 200 in our garden space. And um, we have planted a lot of spruces. There are cypress in our garden. If you really start looking around our space, there is a ton of evergreen interest, but our garden is pretty big and we've had to uh, tear out a lot of things that it might appear like, I mean, there's a lot of baby conifers that we've planted. So anyway, love my conifers. We are trying to add more as we go along because that's so important to your um, winter garden look, uh, but you know, it's not gonna look mature or big or really make a statement until they grow up. But I do love my annuals, I'm not gonna lie. Okay, next video is planting a huge metal container. So I have this rectangular shaped, really tall, 
thick metal container that I picked up at a consignment store for $50 and I love it. I think it is the most a beautiful planter and I'm just so proud of I always love it when I get something for a good deal like that but I found some beautiful plants down at the garden center they had just got in a brand new load of plants and it was still on pallets and I was just in the back picking out beautiful things um, so there's purple fountain grass dahlias uh, super bells bacopa and some lambs ear and it's just really like a really cool color beautiful blend Audrey said, what's the difference between supertunias and superbells? So they're both trailing annuals. Supertunias have bigger flowers than superbells. Superbells uh, and supertunias also grow a lot bigger. So superbells stay more compact. They like to dry out a little bit between watering. So they're really good for hanging baskets and things like that where you have a smaller soil reservoir and the water drains a lot quicker. Supertunias can hold up to a little bit more adversity. So we find that superbells are not suited for in-ground planting. They're for really container only. Um, supertunias you can use either way and some supertunias are even better more more um, suitable for in-ground landscaping uh, than other supertunias like the supertunia vista line is fantastic for in-ground landscaping um, where you want to make a big impact and not have to spend a ton of money so those are just some of the differences right there. Lisa Cheese said, what do you do with the soil you remove? So that gets spread on the new property. If it had like bugs or disease issue, which I rarely deal with, we toss that. We don't want to keep that anywhere on our property. We do not have a compost pile set up. If that was the case, if we had a proper compost pile, you could put it in there. And if it's heating up properly and stuff, it would kill whatever you know pathogens are in that um, soil but we don't have that set up at this time, maybe in the future. But right now we just take that extra soil and spread it out somewhere on the new property. Uh, CJ said, the container surprised me. The flowers look so pretty. I'm a pink, purple, and white flower person too. I'm getting white fly on my supertunias. What would you suggest? Um, so you could use a uh, neem spray, you could use insecticidal soap, you could use Midex, you could use Rose RX. Those are just a few that I've had experience with. Thankfully don't deal with white flies that often, but I would give one of those sprays a try. If we remember to, we'll link some of those down below for you. Next question was, what do you do to the empty Proven Winners nursery pots? Because you might have used thousand or more every season, yes. Do you recycle them or use them some other way? So we actually uh, keep them. We've got a huge pile in the barn. We utilize a lot of empty pots all the time. Like at the end of the season, we dig perennials or whatever out of containers and we repot them and put them in the um, greenhouse. I use the little cans for seedlings when I need to bump them up out of my seed trays. Uh, and then I do have friends and family that will use them in those exact ways too. So I kind of farm some of them out that way. But there is, I believe that Lowe's accepts empty cans and they recycle them. So um, we'll be checking up on that and seeing who's accepting them this year. And then toward the end of the season, when we have kind of our big stockpile, we'll go dispose of them that way so that they are handled in a responsible way where they're being recycled. So we'll probably do a video of that and let you guys know where you can be dropping off your cans as well. Um, and then I thought it'd be fun to do a video at some point, just showing some different fun ways that you can use those empty cans. So that might be something we do later on this season as well. Kelly said, do you store your fertilizer and all your other liquid weed killers out in the barn over the winter? Um, if you do, are they still good to use next year? We do not store them out in the barn over the winter. It's not good to let them freeze. So what we do is anything, oh, there's a bee. Just flew in front of my face. Um, with anything that we have left at the end of the season that's liquid, we pack them up and we take them downstairs to our basement, which it stays like, I don't know, in the 50s in there, so it doesn't freeze. Um, so they, they stay good. Uh, John said, does anyone know what water-soluble fertilizer she uses week to week? She mentioned it, but no, but not the exact brand or type. So we use and have been using for the last several years the Proven Winners water-soluble fertilizer. That's what we do every single Friday. Uh, Nancy said, perhaps a dumb question, but are there drainage holes in that planter? And that is not a dumb question at all, Nancy, because um, with especially a container that you're repurposing as a planter, that's always something that I, I think a lot of people wonder, like, did you put drainage in there? Because that's so important for your plants. We did drill four drainage holes, and I kind of wish I would have said that in the video because you were not the only one who asked that question. So yes, there is drainage in there. I rarely, rarely will use a container that doesn't have drainage. If I do, it's usually like some tabletop garden that has succulents in it, and I have really good luck taking care of those without drainage. Um, but for like your normal annual plants that you're planting outside, drainage is an absolute must, especially if you live in a rainy area, because you cannot control how much moisture that container is getting if it's receiving water in addition to what you're giving it. And Diane said, I think I heard your voice on the radio today for Proven Winners. I'm in Massachusetts. Was that you? Yes, it was me. 
And Alex said, do you have a favorite brand brand of gardening gloves and why? So I'm not a huge fan of gardening gloves. You guys know this. My, my most favorite type are the Atlas Nitrile gardening gloves. They're really thin, um, but I like those because they're so thin and they actually fit my hands well, like my fingers well, um, that I can still feel what I'm doing when I'm working. So I've been trying to wear them more because it does gardening rips up your hands. I mean, there's no way around it. If you don't wear gloves, your hands are going to be like dry and cracked and like perma dirt stuck in all the cracks of your fingers like mine are right now. And I mean, that's not a super pleasant thing but I just like to feel what I'm working on. Um, but the Atlas gloves, I, I have a problem with my thumb in particular. It's not like I have an abnormal shaped hand, but it feels like all other gloves that I put on, the thumb is like a half inch or an inch too big. It's, it's weird. So I just, I can't handle that. Atlas Nitrals are the way to go for me. And I go through several pairs every single, single season. Um, and you know, I garden every single day. So they're getting some pretty hard use, but I probably go through about three pairs, three pair. They're cheap though. Uh, Jess says, uh, the quick question, do you prefer to run drip in your containers using emitters or to use the quarter inch tube with the emitter holes every six inches? So that um, drip that I used in that container had the emitters and that's what I had set up to it last year. So I'm just going with it because it was already set up. I might convert it though, depending on how it's doing. We are trying the quarter inch tubing with the holes every six inches in a lot of our new containers this year. So um, you'll see a video here. Well, I went up this morning of us planting the 14 big containers along our fence line and we used that new uh, drip tubing. And it's nice because it's one coupler and you can just twirl it around your pot and then put an ender and you're good to go. It's so much easier on your fingers. And I, I'm hoping that the coverage is better. So we will be able to report more on that later on this season once we've had some experience. Uh, B. Johnson said, what are you growing on the trellis beside the big galvanized container? That is a Colette rose. So I have two Colette roses, four Colette roses, two, one on either side of the arbors to our vegetable garden. And they are one of the most beautiful climbing roses. They are one of the most thorn filled roses I have ever worked with though. Super thorny. So if that's a consideration, don't plant this one, but they get roses about this big and they look like a David Austin, like an English rose, really soft blush pink and I just love it. I always have. Robert Hendricks said, I love this pot. Do you ever find that your pots get too much water due to being tapped into the drip system? Rarely. I think it's the opposite problem. Usually we start, well, in the past, we've started with half gallon per hour emitters and we'd have to watch the containers and sometimes we'd have to bump up the emitter to like a one gallon per hour or um, whatever. In our area, you really almost can't give our containers too much water, um, especially once it gets really hot. So uh, yeah, it's definitely drip is not once and done. You can't set it up and just like hands off your containers. You still need to fertilize. You still need to put your eyes on them, especially when it's hot out every day. Just like look at your pots and make sure nothing's like plugged or looking sad uh, because there are issues that crop up. There's like they can like form a leak or they can get plugged or something like that. And you don't want to lose your plants. So definitely keep your eye on stuff that has drip irrigation. Kim said, was that oregano that Benjamin tried? Yes, so Benjamin was at the very end of that video. He came and checked out all the plants. He picked some herbs off of the planter next to that big metal planter, and that was oregano. Really good eye, Kim. And right after that, he kind of did one of the, like, oh my gosh, this is way too strong faces. <laughs> okay, next video was planting a shade window box, and that was really fun. That was the window box right by our kitchen door. Um, used some beautiful perennials, one annual in there, a tuberous begonia that's apricot colored. And I just really enjoy looking at that. I just love it. And I haven't had to water it since that day. Like it's an amazingly um, low maintenance window box. Uh, Life with Jesse B said, how do you deal with water damage in window boxes? Also making sure water doesn't damage your house. So when we installed those, there's actually a board that runs back behind them so that the uh, window box doesn't actually sit right up against the house. And this is a type of window box too, that it's completely enclosed. Um, so it's made out of some kind of a plastic, I think, I don't know. Um, but like water isn't leaking out the back and touching our house. There's only drain holes on the bottom. So any water that comes out just drips straight to the ground. So it never touches our house. However, we do have like the hay rack type window boxes, like on the barn, it's the metal kind of rungs with the cocoa fiber. So if you don't put something behind those baskets, they do rest on your house and moisture can get back behind them. So I always recommend like run something back behind them, like just prop a board. There's usually enough weight in that window box to um, pinch a board between the window box or the hay, excuse me, <coughs> the hay rack and your house. 
because that is a big bummer to have something happen to your sighting. Next question is from Amy. Stunning as always, Laura, thank you. Have you thought about incorporating some succulents? I know the watering may be a challenge. I would like to see you do this sometime in future plantings, which I do plan on doing that on our balcony. So we've got a, like a patio area that's attached to our master bedroom upstairs. That is the balcony area. Uh, we actually hardly ever, ever go out there because it is usually roast and hot. In the morning, it gets sun and it's crazy like how it like encapsulates in that space. And I don't really like the look of having an umbrella up there. It's usable in the evenings in the summertime, but I think it's a perfect spot for a succulent or a couple, so I'm looking at it right now, a couple of succulent planters, like maybe close to the railing so you can see them from down here, um, but I wouldn't have to set up a water system because I could just go splash some water on them like once a week probably up there and they would be really happy. So yes, I do plan it on it. I have been thinking about it. I'm just trying to think about what kind of containers I want to put up there. That's my holdup on that project. Chris said all types of supertunia are sold out online and in stores. Is that normal? It's not normal. Um, just this whole year has been atypical just because of COVID-19. And I know that a lot of uh, guard centers are actually open or they're doing curbside if you're not comfortable going in. And I know a lot of places in our area have proven winter's plants. So my parents' garden center has a ton, as do many other garden centers in our area. In fact, there was, uh, there is a pop-up shop that's like 30 miles down the road from us. And they do like a uh, real quick, like they sell for the spring season. And usually they're into June before they close down for the year. And they closed at the end of April because they were completely sold out. And they said they did more plants this year than they ever have. So it's just atypical because everyone's staying home. So everybody's working on gardening projects. They want their surroundings to be more beautiful, which is totally understandable. But I think it would be worth maybe calling around to some local garden centers that you have. Even some box stores will have Proven Winters plants as well. Um, so you can check those sources. And you may have to like drive down to the next town maybe to, to find them but definitely check locally because it'll save you a ton on shipping in the end anyway. Proven Winners, usually they, they have the online option um, when you can actually order stuff on that you want online as just a convenience for those of you who don't have a good local garden center and they'll always recommend that you shop local anyway. I don't know if that was a helpful answer, but uh, maybe just do a little bit more digging locally and hopefully you'll find some of the supertunias. When planting your boxes or containers and stuffing them so full, I never see you add more soil on the top to fill in. No, it's because I don't like to do that. Do you just leave each plant in their ball and place it in and that's it? No, so what I do is I fill my container, uh, like I've done so many containers through the years, I know pretty much how full to plant my container so I can make a little hole where the plant needs to go and I can pop it in and then I just, you know, hill it in. I uh, pack soil in around its whole root ball. So the whole root ball is in soil. There's soil all the way around it, but I do not like having to add soil after I have plants in the container because it usually makes a big old mess. Next question is from Lindsay. You mentioned the weekly fertilizing you do for containers. Would you consider doing a project where you plant two identical containers and fertilize one throughout the summer and only water the other one so we can see the difference in growth? I think that would be interesting. I think that is a really good idea. We've talked about doing that. Like, Aaron, don't you think we've talked about that every year? We did that uh, one year, last year or the year before. Did we? But With... It was at the end of the year. It really was not a So we need to plant something like now. Yeah. We should do that. Yes. Thank you, Lindsay, for the suggestion. Uh, Ron says, what are the spots on your plants? Hard water? Yes, those are hard water spots and that is what we deal with. If any water touches the leaves of plants, if it sits there for any amount of time and dries, that's the deposit it leaves. And that's why it's so important for us to water with drip irrigation. Those are in the greenhouse, so it's really hard to keep the water because we're watering with a hose. I try to get underneath the leaves and get it into the can, but sometimes, especially when we've got a lot of stuff in there, like right now, it, you, just, you just get everything watered and you don't worry too much about where the water is landing. But I still try to be careful, but hard water is just the worst. Iced Gem said, did you make the window boxes? No, those came from Plow and Hearth. We'll link them down below. Steven said, why don't you plant all the window boxes the same? I remember the first time you having them, you made them all look the same. Just curious, uh, the window box is still gorgeous. So I, I think I would get bored if they were all the same. And I feel like since they're all on the different sides of the house, I can get away with doing them a little bit different. So like the ones that face out towards Versailles, if I'm looking at them right now, I can do those differently than I do the kitchen window box because there's never a time where you will see both of those at the same time. And the kitchen window box sits higher than the other ones on that side of the house. So I feel like I can do that one even a little bit differently. My color palette always tends to be somewhat the same, so they always have a cohesiveness about them, I think. And it's just more fun to try out different stuff. 
Um, however, I mean, that seems a little bit weird because like along the fence line, I like to do them all the same, but I think it's because I see them all at the same time and I like the uniformity in that. Edna said, will they bloom all summer? Yes, they will. And Sarah said, why no impatience? So I have the most horrid luck with impatience. I don't know what it is. I can buy impatience and like the four or six packs, like the ones that grow. I mean, they don't put on very much growth at all. There's some kind of like, I don't even know what brand they are. And those survive in my garden. If I plant any other impatience, I just don't have luck. I do have some in the greenhouse and I'm going to keep trying uh, because I think they're beautiful plants. We'll see what happens. <laughs> Next question is from Heather Jackson. Love the combo. Thank you, Heather. Uh, what's the major difference between a Proven Winners plant and their Proven Selections line? So here's what I understand. The Proven Winners plants are trialed nationwide and they're good nationwide in all different kinds of regions and climates. They thrive, they do really well. They're exceptional, exceptional plants, exceptional genetics. And like for example, the Color Blaze Colia series is in the Proven Winners line. And that was the, the one that really struck a chord with me because before the Color Blaze Colias, I couldn't grow Colias in the sun. There's no way in high desert with no protection in the afternoon. Like um, it's just too harsh for a lot of the other coleus I had tried. So we've really been putting the color blaze coleus through the paces in our sun and hot climate. And they are just so phenomenal. They perform and they get huge and they're beautiful. Um, so they're just plants that do well nationwide. The Proven Selection line is still a, uh, a line full of really good plants, plants that Proven Winners, you know, puts their stamp of approval on, but they're not plants that have either been trialed nationwide or they're not as suited for every climate. Like there are some plants that are really good for the South that do really well in hot, humid environments, as opposed to like, maybe they don't do as well in our hot, dry climate. Um, so they're a, a collection of a bunch of really good plants, but they just uh, maybe are better suited for a different region. And some of those plants, if there can be improvement, improvements made, they will end up bumping up to the Proven Winners line. Uh, and it's really interesting. I've noticed over the years, you know, we work with Proven Winners a lot. Uh, like I'll plant something in the Proven Winners line and I'll think like, this plant is amazing. And then the next year they'll tell us like, we're bumping that plant because there's something that's very similar that's better. And, and I'm like, how can you even improve on these plants? It's crazy, like they just keep getting better. Um, so it's just like a little bit of a shift all the time when things get better and improve, like they want the plants in the winner's line to be like the best that they can be. So anyway, that's how I understand it. Last question is, can you explain the whole spectrum of shade, um, part shade, full sun, etc.? So full sun means six to eight plus hours of sun in a day for that plant to perform well. Part sun is four to six hours a day and shade is zero to four hours a day. Um, you might have to shift things based on what it is uh, and based on your area and your climate. So it's really good to ask somebody that's uh, a gardener, like a reputable garden center, um, what their recommendations is. Because like Japanese maples, for example, we get those in at my parents' garden center from the western side of Oregon, which is a climate completely different from ours. It's very rainy, it's very mild. You bring those Japanese maples over to high desert and we, the tag says full sun. We could never put a Japanese maple in full sun here. It would just fry within a few hours. We have to put them somewhere where they get just morning sun and then they're protected in the afternoon. So there's those little quirky plants that you learn over time where you need to position them in your garden, but th that's just kind of like the general guideline. Okay, next video was a flower bed makeover for Mother's Day. Erin and I went over to Erin's parents' house and we just planted, like we redid the irrigation and kind of cleaned up the flower bed and uh, which there wasn't much to do. I cut some tulips back and stuff, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, laid new drip, planted some annuals. I think it's going to be a really pretty space. All ears said, you seem to be lopping off all the tulip foliage at the soil level. Do you expect them to return next year? In my experience, it's best to cut off the spent flowers and leave the rest of the foliage to return its nutrients to the bulb, which is absolutely true. True. And I wish I would have talked about this in the video because that question was asked an awful lot. Usually like we'll go in and deadhead our tulips, get rid of the bloom stock, but then we leave the leaves until they are yellow or brown and flopped over and they look completely died back. Because those leaves, they soak in the sun, which creates energy, takes energy down to the bulb so that, ooh, some stuff's falling on me. That's weird. Anyway, so anyway, yeah. Usually you don't wanna cut off the foliage at the point where I did in this video. And the reason I did that is because um, that particular patch of tulips has been coming up weak every single year. And my mother-in-law was considering removing them completely altogether and then doing something new up there this fall, like planting new bulbs. So we just decided in the end, like let's just clean up the foliage, leave the bulb, see what happens. Like we're just giving them a chance. 
Um, they'll probably come up and bloom, like a few of them will bloom, um, but I can bet you anything she'll go in this fall and plant new tulips in that area. So that was kind of the thought process. Sometimes you just kind of make the call and say, well, this tulip isn't doing that well anyway. I'd rather put something new in there and then yeah, you just go with it. Donnelline said, how much cold can the coleus take? Are you protecting them at night? So coleus is usually pretty tender to cold, especially when it's just come out of a greenhouse, which is where I had been keeping that coleus. It got 37 degrees that night, and I told my mother-in-law Sue, I was like, oh, you might want to throw a pillowcase or something over the top of those, or like put a milk jug or something over the top of just those three, really. Um, and she was like, oh, they'll be fine. And they totally were, because she had already planted out, she starts coleus from seed every year, and she's already planted them out in her backyard. Um, and they're kind of tucked under a tree close to the house, and they look great. I saw them yesterday, which was several days after we planted, and they look great. But usually at our house, like in the fall, um, 40 degrees is when I start seeing things start to, like when it dips below 40, I see those really tender plants start to take a little bit of cold damage. Ryan said, how long ago did you plant the red point maple in your old yard and what size was it when you planted it? Do you remember what year that was? So we moved here in 2016. We must have planted that tree in 2014. It was a couple years old when we moved, when we moved out. Was it two or three years old? So maybe... I'm guessing we planted that red point maple in like 2013 or 14, a couple of year, couple three years before we moved out of that house. And it was the same size as the ones we planted on the west side. So that's one of the reasons I'm so impressed with that tree because they grow fast, really fast. Heather said, can you tell us what kind of tree that she has towards the back of the bed? I'm, I'm guessing you're talking about the ivory halo dogwood because that's what's tucked in the very back of that bed and it really shines in that space because it has white variegated foliage and it just, that white in a shadier area really, really pops. Nikki said, can you link the irrigation line you used? We can only find 18 inches in our store. I'm guessing like 18 inch hole spacing, which is what ours is. It's dig corp, we get it at Home Depot. It's just the brown tubing with, uh, emitter holes every 18 inches. Blanca said, Laura, did you ruin the surprise bird bath gift from your father-in-law by posting this video before Mother's Day? Um, no, I didn't ruin it. She already knew about it. Uh, my father-in-law spilled the beans because I guess an ad came up or something on Instagram. Sue was looking through and she saw this bird bath that was solar operated, had the little fountain, and she showed my father-in-law and just said like, look at this, this is really cool. And he just told her, I ordered you that for Mother's Day, how weird. Um, so anyway, she knew it was coming. And no, we weren't able to walk through our old garden. We kind of ran out of time that day. And one of these days we'll ask Trina and see if she'll let us walk through. Robin said, do you know where Miss Sue got her planters with the boxwoods? Those are from Home Depot. Those are the same pots we have in front of our barn. Um, and I left them that color for like four years and then we just painted them black this year. And I like them both ways. They look good in the natural color in front of their house, though I really like them there. Next question from Joan. She says, what? If you were going to put down mulch anyway, why did you not leave the pruning debris on the ground to put back the organic matter? You threw it away, didn't you? That is how you get bad soil, pretty for now. Um, so I just, I think that's actually a really great question because I think that there, I understand that there are a lot of people who like to just let their gardens be natural and they like to let things just kind of do what they're gonna do and uh, are really concerned about you know adding things back into the soil. But for me, I really like, I, I really love to look at a tidy space. And our area is, oh, I don't think many areas are naturally very tidy. I like formal gardens. I do like a lot of plants and I like to have healthy soil as well. But if I left that pruning debris underneath the mulch, if I didn't put it in a proper compost pile with the proper heat to break down that those leaves they're very thick and it would take it would take forever for those leaves to break down and return actually return to the soil it'd be a lot quicker to put it in a proper compost pile let it break down and then add that to your beds and then you've got nice fluffy rich compost that you're adding back into your soil instead of leaving a bunch of lumpy stuff underneath your mulch if that makes sense um, i get where you're coming from with that though for sure it's just not the method i like to go about it i like to rather add in either, even if it's bagged compost i like to add it in that way where it's already broken down down and then add in a good organic fertilizer and our soil is like really turning around. Um, I had the same experience down at our last garden. It was really crummy soil when we moved in. Anaerobic gray it smelled swampy and by the time we left by adding in gypsum and compost and um, fertilizers every year they were all I used all natural organic stuff. I could I had like really dark crumbly 
soil with earthworms in it. It was a really satisfying process and I never had to leave clippings just laying on the ground. So I don't, we just all prefer different methods. Uh, Mary Ann said lavender hedge. I cannot grow lavender even though I live in a zone 7 South Carolina. What variety is this hedge? I think that variety is Munstead. I'll have to ask Sue to confirm but I'm guessing it's either Munstead or like Hidcote. It could be Grosso. <laughs> <laughs> it could be one of those three. Those tend to be the three that most people plant in this area as a hedge. I'll ask her. Patty said, do you get all your plants, etc., free from your parents' shop? No, the plants I get from my parents' shop, I do pay for. Now I do get a good discount because family, you know, and I would get a discount whether or not I do did what I'm doing now or if I just had my normal garden like I did in our last house before we started making videos, but I do pay for everything that I take from my parents' garden shop. Uh, Melissa said, wait, so you guys used to live directly next door to your parents? Now that's a close family. Um, so that was, yes, Aaron's parents. We lived next door to them for eight years. And I remember when we were considering buying that townhouse, they kind of like sat us down and they were like, are you sure you want to do this? Are you sure you want to live right next door to us? And they ended up being the best neighbors that we ever had. I never really had, um, uh, what is it? Um, what's that word? Any check about it? Is that the right word? Like I never was really worried about it. Um, but like it was a really healthy neighborly family relationship. Um, so I'm thankful for that. And the last question from that video was from the Baileys. What are the two little round boxwood hedges you trimmed in front of the porch? I'm thinking of putting something like that in my new Henry uh, pink cement planters. So the ones I trimmed into round shapes, I think those are winter gem boxwoods. The cone shaped boxwoods in the containers are green mountain. So winter gem, green mountain. Next video is a raised bed cocktail garden. I planted a raised bed we got from Gardener Supply um, that's meant to go on a family's balcony in downtown Boise, Idaho, uh, but we can't go over there yet. We planted it full of herbs and some strawberries that I like to use in cocktails or that I'm gonna be trying in new cocktail recipes this year. And it was just, I think it's beautiful. It's still sitting right where it is. And that kind of goes with the first question. Marilyn said, cannot wait to try all of these. One question, how did you move it? Did you get one with meals? I'm sure that was incredibly heavy. This one does not have wheels and it kind of took till after we were done planting it and filling it with water and soil that we were like, um, <laughs> what did we just do? How are we gonna move this from its space? So right now, days later, it's still sitting in the exact same space. I think we're gonna have to wait until we can get some guys here and we'll move it out like to the brick patio area or somewhere near the greenhouse where um, it can get full sun, but that's definitely not going up to the balcony now. I have a smaller version of that exact bed. It's like a one by four instead of a two by four, I think, or a one by three. Anyway, I think that's actually more appropriately, appropriately sized for the balcony. So once we can go over there, we'll take that one empty and plant it up on the balcony. I don't know what I was thinking. I was just excited. Uh, Jack said, would it work to put the mint in a pot and then bury the pot in the bed with the other herbs? No. If a pot with mint makes contact with soil, even through its drain hole, the mint will grow down through that pot and it will come out through that drain hole and it will root into the soil reservoir. I've had it happen before. You need to make sure mint is in a pot and it's like on a concrete surface. Mint can be the worst. It's awesome, but it can be the worst. Uh, next question, where can I get the seeds or plant for the tomato you showed in this video? Uh, check with your local garden center. I know my parents have that exact tomato in their greenhouse right now, uh, but you can, I believe you can still order those seeds on the Proven Winners website. We'll double check that and link it down below if you can. Laurel said, love, love, love the raised flower bed, but those purple flowers in the planter behind you are glowing. What are they? Those are true blue pansies. They look so great still. I'm going to have a hard time pulling stuff out for summer plants. Uh, a Will says, what hose wand do you use? That is a uh, dram. I was going to say DeWalt. <laughs> DeWalt should make one. Uh, that is a dram water wand and I prefer the one that has the, um, it's like a thumb valve. I don't know. It's not the one that sticks out from the, like the plastic one that sticks out. We'll try to get a picture of it and put it on the screen because I'm very specific about the way it turns on and off because there's some that are total crap, but this one is really good. Amy said, and this is the last question from that video. This is definitely farm to table. Yes, to the max. Um, love the idea. How about tomato juice ice cubes for the Bloody Mary? And I just wanted to read that question or that suggestion because I thought it was such a good one. Like, yes, we should be making some like proper ice cubes so that it doesn't water down your drink. Cause that's like one of the things I do like to have drinks with lots of ice. Like when I make any drink, even ice water, I have ice that fills my cup and mounds up the top. And then I like try to get as much liquid as I can in there. But I like to have a ton of ice. So if you had something like that, 
That'd be awesome. So great suggestion, Amy. The last video from this week was planting these pots required power tools. So in that video, we got all of our 14 containers up on their brick pads, got the drip set up, got them planted, and they're beautiful. I can see them from where I'm sitting right now. Uh, Deanne asked, uh, she said, I'm so glad that you guys are doing your container competition. That was so much fun. Where are the containers going to be? And I thought I had mentioned it earlier on in the video that we are still doing our container competition. It's just going to be, it's going to be in the same pots, but it's going to be somewhere different. We're actually going to tackle that project today, I think. Um, so we'll have that video up later as soon as we get the project done and edited and all that kind of stuff. So you'll see that. But I just, I love seeing the uniformity here. It really helps me when we've got other things going on and, and holes in the garden that we're trying to fix and stuff it helps me to have one area look very cohesive and very striking it brings me peace in that way so this has just been really pleasant to look at for me i love it lewis said the quarter inch brown tubing on top of the soil in the pot has proven very effective for me which was so nice to hear and i was just i just wanted to put that comment in because i just so appreciate when you guys let us know how things have worked for you or let any tips along the way because not everything we do is awesome um, and we learn through failure sometimes how to do things better um, so that's why we're trying out this different method of drip just to see like is it better coverage you know um, is it easier than doing the emitters and all those sorts of things so anyway i'm really happy to hear that diana said i can't wait to see it fill in question when you do the weekly fertilizing do you skip running the drip that day no we just have our drip go on its normal schedule and then we just fertilize on the fertilizing day and typically it doesn't matter for us because we are so hot and dry that they appreciate the little bit of extra moisture. Kayla said, do you have automatic timers on these and all your drip or do you manually go out and turn anything on? Everything's automatic unless we need to adjust something like adjust the amount of time it's running or adjust like right now we're not running everything near as much as we will run it when it's 105 degrees outside every day. Um, so, you know, we have to get in there every once in a while and now everything's Bluetooth so we can run everything from our phone, which is really handy. Uh, Christy said, does Aaron ever ask to do the power tool job? He's a great man letting you do that work. Not many hubbies would want to share that job. Great seeing you do the hard work. <laughs> uh, I think Aaron prefers his job behind the camera. He is much better suited for that than I am. And I like the physicality of my job. I like to do those kinds of jobs. I like at the end of the day to feel like I can put a check mark on that day and feel like, yep, I did this day well. Like I did a lot of work, I feel it. Um, I feel good. I can see the results of my work outside. Like that's what feeds me. Um, and like I, I, I think like the difference is Aaron is a thinker. Like he is big time into like thinking of processes and thinking of how to do things better. And I'm a doer and I rarely like, I just fly into a project and do it. Even if it could be done a lot easier if I like thought about it. And oftentimes I'll get it done faster but I'll get it done in a much harder way, you know, if that makes sense. Yeah, well, like the watering, you'd still be doing everything. By yeah, hand. yeah, that's you'd, a that's a really good point. Out at a certain point. Yeah, that's a good point. So Aaron's like like with the watering, I probably wouldn't have ever tried to figure out how to make the water system better here, uh, and I'd just be watering everything by hand or with sprinklers, which is very true. And he's gone through the painstaking process of getting it all lined up and figured out, and bringing in other people like professionals to help get everything separated. And I mean, because the water system was a mess when we came in to it, and it's really um, a lot better now. So anyway. We balance each other out really well. Veronica said, that's a lot of bags for just one planter. Is there a more cost-effective way to use something else at the bottom and more of the good soil on the top? Um, yes, I actually just talked about that in the metal planter video this week and how oftentimes when you're planting annuals and things like that in pots, they're not gonna utilize, especially in a huge pot, they don't need all of that soil reservoir. I like to fill mine all the way up because it helps with moisture retention, it helps keep the roots cooler, and it helps with winter insulation. If I have things in there that need to be wintered over like evergreens and, and such. So I find it better to do that, but like in big containers like the metal one, I had stuff planted in it last year. It's full of soil all the way to the bottom. I didn't experience any bug or disease issues. So what I did is I just dug out um, the top like foot and a half, two feet of soil and I replaced it with fresh and just left the old soil at the bottom. So I think that's totally fine. People use like plastic bottles or big chunky bark. You can even put like if it's healthy, garden debris you can put it down at the bottom like branches and leaves and stuff like that and essentially kind of create a compost pile at the bottom of your containers uh shirley said the flowers for your pots are beautiful minus the potato vine i'm so over them no matter where you all where, where you go all the pots you see have the ugly potato vine hanging out of it what else can you use so i actually thought about that and i get it because they can look a little bit weary like especially if they've gone through a wind or they've gotten burned from sun because they haven't had enough water because they do require a lot of water 
This specific potato vine, and I forgot to mention this in the video, is not the type that's going to reach all the way down. It's a very um, com more compact potato vine. I think the spread on it, we'll put it on the screen, but the inches, it will just kind of go over the side and maybe halfway down the container is what I'm expecting it to do. So I think it's gonna be a much prettier version. And because of the fact that these are on drip and they get fertilizer every week, they should maintain pretty well and should look pretty fresh throughout the season is what I'm hoping for. Erica said, have you guys ever thought about putting concrete or asphalt in your driveway areas? I know gravel is more economical, but wasn't sure if there was a reason you lay down fresh gravel. Aaron would love to pave. And you know what, I would like it too. I mean, Benjamin would love to be able to ride his bike on a paved road someday. Um, I like the look of gravel. I think it looks soft, especially when you've got a fresh layer of it. Um, I think it's a really good look and there's no harsh lines or anything like that. Uh, it's something we'll probably do later on down the road, but it's definitely not at the top of the priority list. Okay, last question was from Zachy. Oh my gosh, you're deadheading geraniums all the way down that area all season. And I did see that question quite a bit. Um, I think that's gonna be about a 10, 15 minute job once a week. <laughs> I don't think it's gonna be a very big deal. Geraniums are super easy to deadhead and it's super satisfying because you do not need to use any pruners. Like I won't have to bust my Falcos out for that job. I can just go along with a little bucket, pop the spent bloom heads off and it's kind of a therapeutic thing. Um, so I don't anticipate it being a tremendous amount of work. And then of course, everything else I use, the supertunias and a lobularia, I've got, uh, yeah. Those are the only other flowering things in there. None of those need to be deadheaded, so I won't need to be doing a thing to those. So just the geraniums, and I think it'll be fun. And it's okay every once in a while to throw some maintenance in. I mean, I try to do everything as low maintenance as possible, especially in containers, but sometimes you just gotta, you just gotta go for it. So anyway, that is it for this week. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I hope it was helpful to you, and I just really hope that you enjoy your week. And we will see you in the next video. Bye.